For thousands of years, one generation after another has looked for a leader, one who could rebuild what has fallen, establish peace, and bring justice. The ultimate example of that hope may be the Jewish anticipation of a promised deliverer known as the Messiah. While many doubt that the world will ever see such a Messiah, many believe that he has already come and gone. But it's been 2,000 years since Jesus of Nazareth died for his claim to be the King of the Jews. And so a broken and divided world still waits and still hopes. These men, Jewish by birth, share a deep desire to see peace not only in this troubled land of the Bible, but in all the nations of the world. They met south of Jerusalem in the town of Susia. Here, an ancient worship center known as the synagogue is a reminder of the Jewish hope that God would someday make a way to turn the world right side up. They met to explore what the Hebrew scriptures reveal about a central character, a messianic figure that would enter the stage of history and change the world forever. Abner Bosky lives nearby in the biblical city of Beersheba. He teaches the Bible and is also a guide. Dr. Michael Brown lives in the United States. He's a Hebrew scholar and author. Dr. Michael Radelnik, also of the U.S., is a professor of Jewish studies and author. Though all three have Jewish roots, they believe the image of Messiah that emerges from the Old Testament scriptures can only be identified as the first century rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth. You have this picture of the temple, which it's was, yeah, it's a mosaic, which was the center point of Jewish life. So you got the doors leading into the presence of God, the light on either side of the menorahs, some of the festival elements here. But it's interesting, the focus was on the temple, but when this mosaic was done, the temple had already been destroyed, destroyed and there was a, a moving to something else, which was what we call the synagogue today. So, of course, the synagogue, though, synagogue existed when the temple stood as well. Even in Jesus' day. Yeah. yeah. So, And then this synagogue here goes back how far? Probably about 1,600 years ago, around 400, 500. So this is a, a synagogue in the area of Judah, kind of south of Jerusalem. And so every synagogue, no matter where it was, always tried to aim toward Jerusalem. So this is the north side. Right over here, that's where the Torah scroll would be. And that's headed towards Jerusalem. Then. Heading north towards Jerusalem. You actually enter in from the east. And you come in over here. Now, the women wouldn't come in right over here. They would go up in the back where there's a kind of a raised balcony. But uh, everyone would gather here. All the men would come in. And there was a series of steps going up, maybe about four or five steps, to the area where the Torah scroll. That was, was that called the Bema? The bima, which is both a Hebrew and a Greek word, the same word. Right. And they would come up there to read the scroll. So the center of the worship here was gathering together to say prayers and then to focus in on the Word of God. And then there was the cycle of reading that was common at, at that time, where you'd go through the Torah every year. So you have the whole Bible. You have the Torah read regularly. You have the Psalms uh, recited, and you have also other readings from the prophets, mm -hmm. which are uh, And there's some of the historical addition. books, too, in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting when you think about it. Jesus really didn't grow up in a church. He grew up in a place that looked like this. Yeah. How terrific to be here in this ancient synagogue. Uh, 
I was raised in synagogue, loved being in synagogue, and then to go back and see thousands of years before, to be in a synagogue that was really similar to what I grew up in, right. uh, with the same central idea, mm -hmm. which is the centrality of Scripture. There's a continuity there. Yeah. Yeshua, Jesus, was walking on the road to Emmaus and met a couple of people, and He directed them. Uh, this is after His death and mm -hmm. resurrection. He directed them to the Law and the Prophets. And then a little bit later in that same passage in the Bible, in Luke 24, it describes how Jesus comes to His disciples. And they're kind of shocked about this whole death, resurrection of the Messiah thing. Right. And He says, you know, you should have known because the Scriptures wrote of me, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms all spoke of me. And you should have understood that. And so it directs me to go back, okay, the Scriptures are central to our lives. We need to go back and look at the law, at least today, about what does the law say about the Messiah? Because Yeshua said we should have recognized Him based on what it says in the law. So the law, the five books of Moses, that's the foundation. As we're considering the whole issue of the promise and, and God's strategy in using the scriptures to communicate to us, where would we go with that? Well, I think that we have to start. The first place is in Genesis 3.15 in the book of Bereshit, uh, where it talks about, this is after Adam and Eve are created, and then they're put in a perfect place, and they're given guidelines, and then they sin. And judgment is going to fall for their sin. And, and the first judgment actually falls on the tempter. And right in the middle of that judgment, it says, I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So, so between the snake and the woman. Exactly. There's going to be a seed, an offspring of the woman that will crush the head of the, the tempter and the tempter will bruise him or crush him on the heel. So there's going to be sort of a, a climactic battle which will defeat that serpent. So the Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3. You know, the rabbis after the time of Jesus talked about this passage and they said this is none other than King, king Messiah. Messiah. Exactly, the King Messiah. So, so I, I guess the concept would be as the whole world has just been shattered. They're in this perfect place with God. Now sin has come in. They don't know all the consequences, but it's gone from, it's the worst nightmare now. Yeah. And somehow the snake is to blame. And yet there's going to be victory over the, 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 the offspring of, of the human beings or the seed of the woman is going to crush this, this snake so that somehow early on he's going to lose and there's going to be a victory that comes through a human being. We have this first reference to an offspring, a descendant that will crush the enemies of, of people, of humanity. And, but that's, there's no Jewish people yet at this point, but th this is a book given to the Jewish people. And what picks up is that later on God tells Abraham that God will bless his seed, his offspring. And through his offspring, he would bless the world. And this keeps coming up. And I guess what I would say, when we read the Torah, the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, whatever you want to call it, it's like, keep your eye on the seed. I grew up in New York, you know, and we'd go to the village, Greenwich Village sometimes. There'd be a guy on the street, and he'd take a little pee, and oh, he'd, yeah. he'd be doing this thing. Under have, the cups. Or yeah, the... and some guys were really good. They could watch it the whole time. And it, I don't think God was trying to deceive us or hide it from us, but he's basically saying, keep your eye on that seed as we, as we... Uh, don't lose track. Don't lose track. Keep, keep on target. Keep, or baseball, keep your eye on that ball. That's what you're going to do. And so. I, th I think what's interesting, is if we look at the big, big scope of things, we have the, the fall of human beings, sin in the world, and it gets so bad, Genesis 6, God's got to destroy the world before it destroys itself. But he finds one man, Noah. And then through Noah, new generations of people come. And, and then we blow it again. I mean, human beings, we tend to but do isn't it. Isn't it interesting that there's all these genealogies? People say, oh, the Bible's full of genealogies. Well, the reason there's genealogies is to keep our eye on the seed. seed. So, so and, and there's a purpose with all of this. Why? 
So then we get to Genesis 11, human beings, arrogance, God scatters us, but he finds one man, Abram. Why? Because through his seed, he wants to bless the whole world. Yes. So God is going to do something specific through, through a group of people and one descendant of that people. Why? Because he loves the whole world and he wants to bring the knowledge of God to the whole world. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis chapter 12. And then God tells Abraham, you know, uh, kings will come forth from your line and there's going to be a special king. So it's not, it's not just generic seed like all your offspring, but, but there's kind of a focus on an individual a king one. or something yeah. that's going to come out from him. And then, of course, that leads us right. Well, God tells Abram, your seed will bless the whole world. Your seed will ultimately be kings. And then in Genesis 49, it moves from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to one son of Jacob, Judah. And, of course, Judah is promised. And Judah, yeah, there's a specific promise to Judah that the scepter or rulership will come forth. I mean, we think of King David and then King Messiah from the tribe of Judah. Judah. And, and what's also interesting is that the obedience of the nations is to him. So there it is again, the seed, the individual. So we got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, one of the 12 tribes, Judah, and now one king from the 12 tribes. And again, it touches all the nations. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Genesis chapter 49. And so the, it promises a king to whom shall be the obedience of the peoples. Mm. All peoples are going, it's not, he's not just going to be the king of Israel, he's going to be the king that re receives obedience from all the nations. Wow. So if, if you go back to Genesis 3, it, it concerns the whole human race. We just had Adam and Eve then, but they messed it up for everybody. We've been messed up. So it's going to be through a seed, through an offspring that God fixes things. He'll be from the tribe of Judah, but he'll be for, he will lead all the nations. So we know there's a seed. We know he comes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we know that he comes through the tribe of Judah. Judah. And then, of course, it, it goes further as we come into the Torah. Remember, keep your eye on the seed. Now, there's a lot of things that happen. We have the whole story of the Exodus. And we have the story of the, the tabernacle. And we have stories of wilderness wanderings. And right in the middle of the wilderness wanderings, there's this event where a, a false prophet is called upon to curse Israel. He's a Gentile. He's a Gentile. Yeah. He's a false prophet. And, and this false prophet wants to curse Israel, but God won't let him. He controls his speech and he blesses Israel. What's his name? His name is Balaam. And Balaam can't, can't curse. And then he says in part of his blessing, and his third, he has three oracles. In the third oracle, he speaks of a seed that will come forth, come out of Jacob. And this seed will be an exalted king, and he'll have an exalted kingdom. Mm. How amazing where is that? Is, where is that? That's Numbers 24, 5 through 9. Uh -huh. The seed that will come from Jacob with an exalt, who is an exalted king, an exalted kingdom. And then in the next oracle, he talks about a king as well. Uh, and, and that's the one that will rule over the nations. I'm sure you know the passage I'm talking about. Yeah, and when you go down a little further, Numbers 24, it says, I see him, but not now. Some of the medieval... I behold him, but not near. He's in the distant future. Yeah, so, so some of the medieval rabbinic interpretation says, I see him, that's David, but not now. That's the Messiah. Ah, so, so, it's a preview of coming Davidic attractions. Yeah, exactly. But... but the, Ultimately, we see David come, and he's kind of the, the forerunner, the, the prototype, the foreshadowing of the Messiah in so many ways. But, of course, he's from the line of Judah. And, and here's Balaam seeing it, and even the rabbinic exegesis saying, yeah, I, I see him, David, but not, uh, that's the Messiah. So even they're recognizing messianic prophecy right there in the Torah. The prophecy of Balaam, son of Beor, the prophecy of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty and whose eyes are opened. 
I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. A ruler will come out of Jacob. Numbers chapter 24. What about Moses though? I, mean, yeah. I, I mentioned David, he comes a few hundred yeah. years later. But Moses is the leader yeah. of that generation, right? And, and the author of the Pentateuch, of the law. Is he a prototype? Is he a model in any well, kind of way? A Moses is, is promised. He, he says to the people, it says, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me. And Moses, this is in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. Moses then repeats, he says, God will raise up for you a prophet like me, or uh, there will be a prophet like Moses. And so, you know, a lot of people say, well, every prophet's like Moses. They all speak for God. But there's something very distinctive about Moses. In Numbers 12, when there was sort of a rebellion against Moses, what, what uh, it says is that, uh, no, 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 Aaron, Miriam, you're not like Moses. Right. No prophet will be like Moses. You know, if, when I have a prophet, I'll speak to him. And she's to, called a prophetess. She's too. a prophetess, yeah. yeah. But it's, when I speak to a prophet, I'll speak to him through dreams and visions. Not so with my servant Moses. Him I will speak to face to face. Mm -hmm. And so there's this idea when there's a prophet like Moses, it has to be a prophet to whom God speaks directly, face to face. So now you're saying it's not just a seed. It's not just through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not, it's not just, just a king. Not just a king, not just through Judah. But now there's a whole prophetic dimension to this special person's Person that's ministry. Going to come. And, and you know what's fascinating about this? The, the Hebrew there speaks of a prophet being raised up like Moses. The identical language, Deuteronomy 34, Deuteronomy 18. And then God works signs and wonders and miracles through him. There was no one else like that. So even if. There were many prophets in a way like Moses. They heard from God, they spoke. There was not one like Moses. Moses. So by the time of the New Testament, we know the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, maybe a group called the Essenes, but Jewish, religious Jews of that day, they were looking for a messianic figure and for a prophet. You know what's fascinating? When, when you started to introduce things and talk about the end of Luke 24, and Jesus with his disciples. So well, they're... Well, they didn't understand, right? Right. He, and then he lays it out. I wish I could have been there to yeah. hear him lay it out in the law and the prophets and the writings. Yeah. But then he says... He uh, opened open their, their minds. minds to understand. So, so, it, it's so the, finally, I think they take the connection of the Bible and they say, ah, he's the one that fulfilled it all. And so here's the question. I think that what happens once we see him as the fulfillment... All of a sudden we see other things that maybe weren't as evident. That's why, how our minds get open. So I was wondering if you guys have some things that once we came to believe that Yeshua or Jesus is the Messiah, and now we go back and read the Torah, and it says, you know, Moses wrote of me. That's what Jesus said. Yeah. Okay, what do you see? I think one of the fascinating images comes in Genesis 22 with the binding of Isaac. Jewish tradition, Isaac is 37 years old. It seems from the account that he's just a boy. And God tells him to, God tells Abraham, sacrifice Isaac on, on Mount Moriah. Which is the promised seed directly for Abraham. Right, you're going to kill, the promises are all there. And that's th that, the end of it. So he, he's about to do it and ready to kill him. And no, 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 God says don't do it. And here's what's fascinating. There's a ram in the thicket, and they sacrificed the ram instead. But God had told Isaac, when Isaac said, hey, we got the wood, we got everything ready for the sacrifice, where's the sacrifice? Because he doesn't know it's him. And, and Abraham says, God will provide a lamb. And somehow in Jewish tradition, the idea of Isaac's willing self-sacrifice becomes an image of the, the death of the righteous, and how when the death of the righteous person comes, it can take on the sin and the guilt of a generation. And there are many rabbinic stories that say that all of the sacrifices that came after were remembering Isaac and what he did. Or when you blow the ram's horn, the shofar, that that's a remembrance to the sacrifice of Isaac. Of course, he didn't actually die. Mm -hmm. He didn't shed his blood, even though the rabbis talked about the blood of Isaac. What a foreshadowing of the one who gave himself and who actually was the lamb. His father of God. gave him. Yeah. Where the knife was not 
withheld. Yes. The writer of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, who's also Jewish and writing to Jewish people, says when you read back at the, the story of faith in the Torah, you'll see that the story of Abraham and his offering of his son Isaac was a picture, and even receiving him back again to life, was a picture of what God did with the Messiah, who gave his son and again raised him up to life. So uh, there are other pictures like this as well in the Torah. Uh, another one, Joseph. Yeah, you know, when Jesus says that Moses wrote about him, I think it's in multifaceted ways. So you look at Joseph, here he is chosen with a divine purpose, but he's not recognized or understood by his brothers. He, he ends up getting sold into slavery in Egypt. And then in Egypt, he's just in the lowest pit, he's in a dungeon. God raises him up. He becomes revered among the Egyptians. So he's revered in the Gentile world, but still unknown to his own people. If you parallel that with Jesus the Messiah, loved as the Christ in the church world and the Gentile world, but most of the Jewish people think he's foreign and he's dead for all their concern. And, and then his, his, he ends up not only becoming the savior of, of, of the world at that point through dealing with famine and all of this and providing, and Joseph has divine wisdom to do it, but now his brothers come and the second time around he reveals himself and they realize this guy that they thought was this foreign savior, or this foreign leader is actually our own brother and through him they're saved as well. It's, it's an amazing kind of picture. They're delivered from the famine but it's a great picture because ultimately we're going, all our people will recognize that Yeshua is our brother. Right, he's, right. He's, he's not us. that foreigner. He's not a foreigner. No. He's of us. So as people were beginning to look into this, you know, whether it be Jewish people in Jesus' day or rabbis a little bit later, they were struggling with this issue of, you know, what is this seed going to be? Is he going to be a a suffering one, a rejected one, is, is he, he going to be, be or is, and then the whole question goes back to Moses again, what about this issue of sacrifice? Yeah. And, oh, it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And so that basis of sacrifice is that God takes a sinful person, he goes to a goat or a lamb, he puts his hands on that lamb and there's a kind of an identification where the sin goes into the sacrifice. And then that sacrifice has to die instead of me, the sinner. And then, of course, there's the acceptance of that and the new life and so atonement. The, there's an exchange. Mm. An exchange the life of the, going the, on. The, of the, the person who has sinned. Guilty party. The guilty party. That one goes, he, his, that payment is made through the death of the animal, and then life is given to the, the And that's person the sinned. central teaching in terms of the temple and in terms of the teachings in Genesis that God has an exchange of life principle going on which this involves principle forgiveness. Gets established in the Torah mm -hmm. and comes to fruition with the coming of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. What a picture then yeah. of, of Jesus again that, that he representing us, standing in for us, dies so we could live. Wow. Yeah. Well the the I, I I still would love to have been on that in that room when Jesus taught his disciples about the law and the prophets and the writings. But I think just by reading the law we can see now what he was talking about huge, when he said Moses wrote of me. And as, as I was a, a Jewish young man growing up uh, in an observant home, I was confronted with Yeshua as the Messiah. And I wanted to not believe in him, but it was through studying the, these passages, some of these passages that we looked at yeah. today, that I became convinced that Yeshua was the Messiah. And one passage that really struck me, that bothered me, was the passage about the prophet like Moses. Because it, there's an interesting part that it says there that when that prophet like Moses comes, that God had promised that that prophet will get, speak God's words and we have to listen to him. And God expects us to hear him. And I think that's the, the message of the promise of Messiah. Our world is so filled with troubles that so many people are looking for some special leader, some special uh, person, a great leader or a president or a prime minister or someone that will bring some peace, bring some answers to the problems in this world. And yet the Bible says that the answer is not in a human king 
or a human president or a prime minister, but rather in God's special Messiah, his anointed one who will establish his righteousness on the earth. 